of DF is the spacing between the screws and hence your local buckling or minor axis buckling, you take the unbraced length. What is unbraced length? Did you not study in steel design what is unbraced length? Unbraced length is the distance between the two brace points. That is called an unbraced length. Okay, so you will have this one or you can have uh, what is known as major axis buckling where the total length, here there is no major axis buckling, here is only minor. Major axis means the load carrying capacity will be higher. So by doing this unsheathed to sheathing, you are transforming this failure mode. Okay, hence there is a more load carrying capacity that you can get. Right? Okay. So having said that, we will go to the next. So this is the CFS stud. The track, top track, bottom track, it is buckling minor axis, we put the sheathing, then sheathing, because of sheathing, it goes through minor axis buckling, but the spacing is 2DF, or it undergoes major axis buckling, where the entire length is taken into consideration. So, unsheathed CFS columns, sheathed CFS columns, so the design says that the design is a minimum of L equal to 2DF, or major axis buckling, which is great. So, by putting a sheathing, you are transformed. Now, which is a saving? because you are not using bridging or blocking, internal members are reduced. So, the amount of steel that is being consumed, what is the cost of steel? Anybody? Cost of steel? Okay, it's anywhere from 80 to 85,000 for coal form steel per ton. Okay, with fabrication, transportation, it hits around 1 lakh, 1 lakh 5,000 depending upon how you negotiate. Okay, so that's the cost of steel. So roughly you can take this 100 rupees per case. Okay. So in IIT Hyderabad there are more than 35 buildings that are being constructed right now. We have 600 plus acres. Okay. But the only building that we have in steel is our steel engineering building. I told my colleagues that this is the most valuable asset in the entire IIT Hyderabad campus because when we constructed it, it was 30 rupees per kg steel. Now it is 100 rupees. But by zero investment, you have tripled. So the, the, this is the most valuable building and if you don't like it after 100 years, you can remove the nuts and the bolts and you can reuse it. Unlike concrete, whose strength degrades by default over a period of time, the strength of the steel still remains. Your grandmother's necklace, gold chain is still more valuable, right? Like steel, right? But the only problem with steel is that you have to protect it against erosion, for which you have to take care of it. Which is good even for you know, concrete buildings if you don't whitewash. Okay, leave inside a, your room, that's not an issue. But the outside room, okay, please do whitewash after every four or five years because that's your first layer of defense against all the chemicals that are coming out of the gases coming out of your automobiles. Okay. <coughs> this screws can be transitioned or replaced by three springs KX, K1, K3. Okay, I am not the first person to work on this. People have been working on it since you know, 1947. Okay, so the first question is what the heck are you doing now by working on this coal from steel and other things, right? That's a natural question. Why are you doing this again, right? So, so people have done this axle compression design specifications available in AIC 2013. They have, you know, they have this design of Wallstrom. This is a research report 13.1. This again, it's available in the web. People Green et al. Winter, Winter 1972, PCOS 1994. All these people have worked. So, what is the new thing? All these people have worked only on axial compression. Only on axial compression, and they said that that can be used for flexure also. The same design equations that has been developed for axial compression can be used for flexure also, which is very irrational. Coming from this land, we talk about rationality, right? So that is very irrational, right? So we said that this is there is something wrong with it. An Indian living in some remote place, commenting on an American specification, telling that you are wrong, sounds weird for them. So we have to prove our point. So. What we said is, although there is literature, the design methodology approach seems to be incorrect for flexural loading case. Okay, why is this incorrect? If you look at this, this is the section C 2.2 of ASI. They say that when both flanges are so connected, no further basing is required. That is point number one. 
Point number two, if the unbraced length of the member exceeds or equals 244, additional bracing is required. Here they say no bursting, here additional bracing. Then Eurocode says that only steel bracing. AAC research said that doesn't matter as long as the KX KY KFE is effective, you can use it. So it is confused like the Janagraj joke. Right? It is a mixture, it is confused. What to, do I follow? As I told you, code and specifications are important because that's the one that is going to help me to prevent. Right? Protect me. That's my kavash. That's my shield. But the shield is giving me confusing answers. So what do I do? Okay, that's the point. So differences in design guidelines and to add matters work, it is also different from the reality because we did our own test. The test result says that nothing will happen, but we can say that failure is happening. Right? So when we say something, we have to say it with certainty. We have to do experiments, calibrated experiments to prove or disprove certain things. So what is the problem in ASI? So that's what we wanted to find out. So we said that the design approach, there are two things, KX and KY, which is theoretically determined. It's okay. KFE, they say that they are de determining experimentally and the ASI is using an experimental test setup to determine that. When we look at the experimental test setup, the experiment, I move this side to this side for more reason. When I'm standing statically, you know, people tend to sleep. Over the years, you know, I've been in this business for almost 12 years and in the industry for several years. You know, we used to stand and talk at one place. If the eye movement is not there, right? People tend to sleep. So that's why sometimes the slides would be colorful. One is black, one is white, just to make sure that it is getting you some excitation. So the test is set, set up suggested by ASI, if you look at it, you see that they are having the C channel, right? And this is what they are trying to study here. They are putting a screw at this and then they are receiving board and pulling force, they are pulling it by an actuator. When they pull it by an actuator, it comes like this and then this is the pulling force. Depending upon the stiffness of the sheathing, either it can undergo what is known as withdrawal of the screws. If it is, a, say for example, if it is a, a plywood, it will undergo withdrawal of the screws. If it is going to be, say, gypsum board, which is a soft sheathing, it will undergo pull through, pulling through failure. It will result in twisting or it can have breakage here at this location where the connection is here. This location it can have breakage or it can have breakage at these locations. So all these are fundamental flaws in the test setup that they have been developed and given in the ASA code. So we said that this is irrational, incorrect. This is not the right test setup to do so. So we had several objectives. So we carried out close to 176 full-scale test specimens. Each span is in 2 to 5 right now. And we studied different sheathing boards, different screws, okay, different types of channel, C channel, C section, hat section. So whatever that is given in the American codes is only for C section. They call two by fours. What is a two by four? Two by four is nothing but in the US most of the houses are built from wood timber, right? Design of wood structures is a course that I have taken. It's a full fledged three credit course, solid course. They have southern point, they have this kind of wood, that kind of wood, moisture content, the knot, the thickness, is it a timber, is it a lumber, all these definitions will come into place. Okay, it's very, very interesting. They go up to three floors for wooden structures. And the wood is very well abundantly available, abundantly available. US is three times India, but one third or one fourth of our population. They are 1.4 billion, they are 300 millions, but the size is almost half the continent. <coughs> So they have, they produce in a state where in Alabama, the biggest they export is trees. They will plant the trees, cut it and sell it. And that is the primary construction material. So they use what is known as 2 by 4. 2 by 4 is 2 inches in width, 4 inches in depth. 1 inch is 25.4 mm, right? So 50 by 100. So what they said is that they are going to replace this wood by cold form steel. So the cold form steel depth, web depth is going to be 100 mm and the width is going to be 50 mm. This is what they call 2 by 4. So almost always they used this C channel but ignored these two cross sections. Okay, you cannot write a code only for very specific cross sections and say it is generic. The code has to cater to all the other cross sections or you put a disclaimer, don't use any other cross section other than C channels but they have not done so. Right? Now, we did all this stuff. And before we did it, we also wanted to say whether the full-scale testing, can we do it? So this is the test setup, again, given by full, for full-scale test setup by AISM. They want you to have this one. This is the material that we are going to test. They want to put a hole here and then put this kind so that it will not, uh, it is, it will not twist. Okay. But this again is wrong. Why? Because when we tested it, when we put the hole, 
the perforations got elongated and they are dictating or influencing the failure mode. So when you do testing in cold form steel, it is like a papa, you cannot put a pencil hole into the pearl and say that well, I am going to study the string. The moment you put it, done. Okay, so you have to test it, but without damaging the parent material, you have to test it. So putting a hole is a big no-no. So then again for this one, we have to come up with a test setup. And this is the test setup we came up with. This is an innovative test setup where we put it with the use of plates, we lock it. So it will allow only bending but not twisting. So this is a test setup. You have, you see this film? This is one, this is a pictorial view of this test setup. And we have put them chains here. You know why we put them chains here? Not to make your specimens as your slaves, but we put chains for one thing in wire. Because steel, unlike concrete, okay, there's a tendency for it to fly also. Steel testing, you have to be very careful. So uh, people are taking close pictures, so we wanted to as a additional mechanism, something happens, the chains will pull. So we have a chain and we lock it at two ends, okay, and then we test it. So that's why we will put these chains here in this location. You can see the chains, right? Right, so the test results were very interesting. It says that when you have a thicker sheathing and a closer spacing, it has a higher bracing effect. So we studied two different types of sheathing. One sheathing is 12.5 mm, one is 15 mm. So two sheathings. Why did we do the two sheathings? Because at that time, St. Gobin was actually constructing our hostel blocks and they were using for the roof, they put some gypsum boards. I was a poor researcher, I didn't have money to purchase anything. I just called a fellow, hey, can you lend some specimens we are using it. Out of pity, he gave me the specimens that he used, uh, then uh, all the broken things. We came to a central workshop, we cut and slice it and we used that. So he gave me two different types of, and that is also good because that is what the normally used um, uh, you know, gypsum sheets that were used in the industry. So two different types, 12.5 and 15 mm, so we used that. And uh, we had these, uh, you know, different types of cold form steel uh, sections, so we studied all that stuff. And we put spacing also, one spacing was 150 mm, the screw spacing, another spacing was doubled, 300 mm, what happens? 150 was recommended, 300 was recommended, we wanted to know. The study clearly shows that the, the green color one, you can see that 15 mm and 150 mm, so the thicker this board, Closer is the spacing, higher is the load carrying capacity. Similarly, thinner is your board, more is the spacing, lower is your load carrying capacity. You can see the blue power one. So, which was very good. Okay. So, that was one of the major conclusions that we got. We got to publish a good number of papers in Journal of Structural Engineering and things like that. And we wanted to study what is the effect of this cross section. Okay. What if the effect of the cross-section as well as the slenderness, if the, the slenderness of the cross-section is very low, what happens if the slenderness of the cross-section is very high? What does it mean if the slenderness is very low? If the slenderness is very low, it, be, it means basically it is a thicker cross-section. Slenderness is an indication of the thinness. Right? More slender, more thin, less slender, less thin. Right? If it is lower slenderness, lambda sub e, <coughs> What it says is that the improvement in load carrying capacity is only 43%, 68 and 53. There is a difference in the way in which the cross sections are going. But if it is highly slender, okay, it can go up to 173, 470 and 600 also. What does it mean? It is very highly slender. It means that it really needs some strength. See, you are fasting for two days, right? And then at the end of the uh, second day fasting, they give you a, if you see them watch the Gandhi movie, uh, let me now have some uh, uh, lime with a little bit of salt on it and then you know, you see them. And drink that. Okay, that the water that you drink is that highly effective. Because you have been starving for two days and you get that cup of water, that is the most effective. So you are in a very slender, fragile, this thing. The moment you put the sheath in, immediately it increases the strength by 600% or 400 but if you are fully saturated, right, you go to say whatever restaurant and uh, name it, okay, you have this full food and then if somebody gives you, you know, even so somebody gives you a nice, uh, what is the best quality of uh, chocolate uh, ice cream? Hagen dazs Have you heard the term Hagen dazs If you want to really taste a chocolate ice cream, you have to taste Hagen dazs because once you taste the Hagen dazs you will not taste any other ice cream. Guaranteed. So if even if somebody gives you Hagen dazs you will not touch it because you have been fully satiated. 
That's the reason it is taking the low strength, 43, 68, and 53, because it is low slenderness. When it is highly slender, the load carrying capacity increases 600 percent. Okay, so we studied this design results with the, you know, the experimental results with the design. What does the design say? So we calculated with the, the design says that you have to calculate kx, ky, kx. Okay, kx is the spring stiffness in x direction, ky is the spring stiffness in y direction, kx is the rotational spring stiffness, and we wanted to study. <coughs> what we realized is that when we put kx, ky, kf, all of them combined together and incorporated in both the flanges, we saw that the AISI, American Iron and Steel Institute, is overestimating the sheathing stiffness. It predicts that the stiffness will not fail in LTB. What is LTB? Lateral torsional bucking. What is lateral torsional bucking? Anybody know? What is lateral torsional bucking? I'm introducing a new term. What is lateral torsional bucking? I know some of you are laughing. I understand your frustrations. What is lateral torsional bucking, my friend? You are which class? Second year, third year, fourth year? No, no, behind him. Ah, behind him. Yes, you. <laughs> don't look at the other person. <laughs> okay, I don't want to put you on spot line. That's one way of keeping people quiet. You call a person. See, I, as a student, you know, graduate student, I got a fellowship called the NSF, uh, you know, preparing future faculty fellowship. You know, people cheat, especially students cheat in a classroom. For one reason, they think that the instructor does not know them personally and hence they tend to cheat. Cheating is popping assignments, exam, not being faithful, not studying, not doing anything. So the interesting thing that they told me is to memorize the names of all the students. You have to know your students' names. The moment you know the students' names, what happens is that you get connected and then they will not cheat. So the likelihood of avoiding cheating and other things is to have to call everybody by name. Okay? If you do so, 90% of your problem is solved. So, anyways, that's a side note. Let's not go deep into that. Okay. So the co the codal provision says that KX, KY, KF, right? If you incorporate all the stuff, A says cheating is over predicting. This will not fail in LTB. LTB means lateral torsional buckling it happens when a member is subjected to beam. You know, beam is there, you apply a load like this, you expect the beam to bend like this. Yes or no? You expect the beam to bend like this. But if the beam is very long and you put a load like this, the beam will try to bend down, but in going down, it is spending more energy, okay, you are troubling the beam too much. Okay, the beam will think, is there a way in which I can go down without going straight? You understand what I am saying? Is there an alternate load pack? Okay. So it will go up to some extent and then if you push it down, it will suddenly bow out and then twist. Okay. So that, my friends, is called lateral torsional buckling. So you should know how much. So if you set as an uh, instructor, I don't want to set the question paper too high or assignment too high because people will either cheat or don't do something. If you keep it too low, you are insulting their intelligence. So you need to find a sweet spot where it is not too tough, not too low. You find, you know, somewhat... Out of five questions, three are easy, two are tough, so that you can differentiate and give A grade to someone and C grade to someone, right? So here, when you apply the load, okay, it is trying to go down, it is trying to spend more energy, it cannot spend more energy beyond a point, then it twists. That, my friends, is called lateral torsional bucking. But to be honest with you, if you look at any textbook in this world written so far, right from Timoshenko to the latest textbook, they say that it is a three-step process which is, it goes down vertically and then goes sideways and then twist. So, lateral torsion, step one going down, step two going sideways, step three is twisting. But I personally have conducted more than 100 to 200 experiments on lateral torsion buckling alone. There is no such thing as step one, step two and step three. Okay, and I apply the load, it's always nice to go to the lab and sit when my students are doing experiments, especially buckling experiments, because you also learn something new. It goes down like this and twists like this and it goes like this. There is no three-step process. So what I understood is the three-step process is simply for mathematical definition where you can get a nice neat equation, okay, for simplicity purposes. But in reality, there is no such thing as three-step process. It's all combined into a one-step process. It goes like this, comes like this and it goes like this. 
So that, my friends, is an important take from this lecture that I am going to give today. I am giving lateral torsional buckling is not a three-step process. Okay. So here you see that the, it buckles laterally, but the specimen fails in lateral torsional buckling, which means that ASI is overestimating, is telling that nothing will happen, but in reality the specimen fails. That is a dangerous thing. So why is that happening? That is also a big important question. Because when you have axial compression, the entire screw is getting engaged here. It is, this is the screw, so it moves away from this screw, the entire screw is getting engaged. Okay. And this is how they did the test. So the screw is completely engaged here, you are pulling it here, you are pulling it here. But when you subject it to the flexure, the specimen is experiencing twisting effect, where in case it is actually pushing it like this, pushing it like this, it is not getting engaged, it is failing through, pull through. You understand what I am saying? So the failure mechanism is very different, hence the load carrying capacity for a screw, when it is subjected to flexure, is very low. So what they say is that, you can use all these things and they are assuming, still assuming that it is, this is how it is going to fail, which is perfectly alright when they subject it to axial compression, but certainly not true when it is subjected to flexure. So that was the basis of our argument. So we put forth that argument and the failure mode is different. So this is a different failure mode, this is a different failure mode. So what we did is that let's not rock the boat. Okay, they have given certain stress setup. Let's try to see. So instead of putting KX, KY, KF, is there a combination that we can put? Can I put KX and KY? And put I put KY and KF, or put I put KX and KF? Can I do this uh, Jumla, Jagleri, Tamil, Malamaritano? Can I do all these things and still be able to survive? <coughs> right? That's the thing. So we did combination too. So we said, okay, can I do the KX and KF and incorporate it? Okay, when I did so, the shape is still the same, it is not twisting. Again, we see that, again, six specimens, okay, is still failing. That's not correct. So we said that the second, K, combination one is KX, KY, KF, it's not working. Okay, I put KX and KY, it is not still working. When I put combination three, KY and KF, it is perfectly working. Because that combination produces the deformed shape. This deformed shape is for unlipricy channel. This deformed shape for lipricy channel. All of them are conservative. 16 of the 16 when KX is removed, which means that the KX is the culprit, which is artificially increasing the stiffness. The culprit here is KX because it is providing lateral restraint artificially, which happens in axial compression, but certainly does not happen in flexion. So this K, KY, KX is a fellow. So when we remove that fellow, it is working very well. So we can see that this is you know, uh, 1, 2 and 3, every one of them is greater than 1.1, right? So there is nothing in red here, okay? And this one we saw that improvements in ASI design methods were gypsum sheath, wall panel subjected to building journal of structure engineering. It was almost a two year battle to get this published. Why? Because we are from a nation which is considered to be still under developing state. We are pushing against somebody and we are telling that they are wrong. But we had experimental data to prove that, so finally we were able to push it. So we don't want to stop here, we wanted to formulate a design also. Okay, so in this, in this new test setup of design, what happens is that you cannot keep on doing large scale experiments for everything. So we need to have a new test setup. We said that this is wrong previously. Remember, we said this is wrong. So we said that this is the wall panel, and we have a small wall panel here, and we took the isolated portion here, and we applied the load here. What we are doing is that we are producing the twisting effect. You see, this is the C channel. When you put a, pull a load like this, pull a load like this, there is a tendency for this to twist. Because we are applying X 